The Future China Global Forum is brought to you by Business China Singapore. Held in Singapore on 20th and 21st July, the Future China Global Forum featured more than 50 speakers sharing their insights across 16 plenary and panel discussion sessions. China's economy, after more than 20 years of stellar growth, is having to contend with a single-digit report card. Meanwhile, domestic issues such as income disparity, oversupply in the manufacturing sector, as well as territorial disputes, emerging world order and other international issues continue to post challenges for China. What do all these mean? Where are the opportunities? Future China Global Forum 2015 The definitive platform for knowing China President Xi Jinping Signature Initiative the One Road, One Belt initiative and what it could mean for China, what it could mean for the neighbors of China, and what it could mean in terms of its impact on the geopolitical and macroeconomic picture. And the question to you is, what could be the impact? What could be the way this initiative will reshape China's economy, will create new sources of growth, and how it would, in a way, reshape China's economic links between, with, with the neighbors in Asia. So, Justin. The situation now is that China increasingly rely on the importation of natural resources to sustain its development. Currently, China is the largest importer of the oil and almost all the major natural resources like iron and so on. At the same time, China changed from uh, extremely scarce in capital to relatively abundant in capital supply. And the labor force in the past used to be relatively abundant, now become relatively scarce. So with this kind of change of situation, China certainly needs to secure its supply of natural resources, including oil and other raw material. At the same time, China needs to find out a new market for the product that China now has complete advantages. And those kind of products are in relative capital skills, capital abundant, technological abundant, like in the construction material and so on. And I think they proposed, they proposed to have one bill, one row. This initiative is one stern here to birth. So there's a lot of debate what should be really be the focus of this uh, initiative. And uh, I can tell you uh, there's a debate about uh, whether there's a strategy or just a proposal. There's a debate about this is our project, this is my project, China's project, or everybody else's project along the road. And there's a debate about, this is about the belt or about the road. This is about the land strategy or about the maritime strategy. There's a debate, debate, a debate about, uh, is this a Zhou Bian Wai Jiao periphery diplomacy or this is China's global outreach. And uh, there's also a debate about, is, really about, is this really about geoeconomics, geobusiness, or really about geopolitics? And uh, there's also a debate about in, in international media, you probably heard a lot about that. This is, is this a Chinese version of Marshall Plan, or is this a new version of new colonialism, expansion to the outside world, or this is just uh, export, uh, China's um, capacity of overproduction and uh, trying to new round of opening up, going out, going out to the world or integrating, integration into the global economic systems. 
So there's a lot of debate about that. And uh, so far, I find um, we need to be careful about the discourse, about really this initiative is about. Otherwise, it will become something of everything. And you just uh, lost the focus. Now, from the ASEAN perspective, I think the ASEAN countries see One Belt, One Road as complementary to what we are doing. Many of you will be aware ASEAN is trying to build an economic community as part of the ASEAN community. And under that, there is already a master plan for ASEAN connectivity. In fact, under the master plan for ASEAN connectivity, there, there is already a list of priority projects. So I would actually encourage China and the other countries, take a look at the list. Why not pick some of the projects from the list? And if it fits with what you want to do, well, we can start by doing that. And I think that will help to get the One Belt, One Road off the ground, you know, with some substantive projects. Uh 第一大好处呢这个风险呢相对来说就不是由自己单独承担了 Because it's economically driven, the businessman has a very important role. Now China can go outside, but what about execution? I've seen again, China go out and buy a company, and then the whole team left, and they don't know what to do with the company, right? So there's an execution. Here in Singapore, it's great because we're multinationally, predominantly Chinese. Chinese feel comfortable here. If we base out of here, where Chinese creates their own brand of management, where Chinese, Singaporeans, the regional people, Western, which is a really what Singapore has to offer, and use this team to go out to execute, they don't run into the same problem as they go straight in China, go out and execute. They need an interim phase. There's a role in execution we can play because we have knowledge, we understand the system, Plus, of course, each places have different uh, belts and roads. Earlier, Ambassador mentioned, think beyond that. Singapore is a financial hub. Singapore is an international hub. Singapore's situation right here. For them to go overseas, to stop here as a control center, to build a management, to execute, to go overseas, is natural. What I'd like to do is to ask the speakers to think about this discussion in terms of the world, uh, let's say, in the year 2050. If we look ahead 35 years, uh, for example, uh, is it logical to imagine that the U.S. 7th Fleet will still be based in Yokosuka, Japan in the year 2050? Uh, is it logical to imagine uh, that uh, China's role and its activity in the region will not be much greater? Uh, and if it's logical to imagine those kinds of things, then what kinds of changes do those imply? As Clyde mentioned, would there be a war in 2050, 35 years down the road from today, Will there be a war among these three nations? I would say that confidence rate drops to less than 50%. Recently, because of the uh, US policy uh, uh, of pivot to Asia, um, yes, US needs Japan, so it like to see Japan rearmed itself 
and change the article and then try to go to Cambodia or Africa or whatever, uh, do peacekeeping missions. But, but, you know, just think of it this way. If Korea and Japan opposes till, till the end, till the death, Japan can never become a normal country because, because Japan was the aggressor in the sense. And, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I really, really love to see Japan go out and play uh, a major role in international uh, arena. Uh, but because of this current political leadership, I think they are doing a great, great disservice to young people because when these young people go outside of uh, Japan, and try to uh, be a, you know, uh, you know uh, international organizations or whatever, they just don't know their own history. So when, when you talk to these Japanese young people, they are being stupid. And, and, I mean, you didn't know about the Nanjing massacre, you didn't know about the sex slaves, you didn't know about whatever the atrocities that, that Japanese military committed in, in Indonesia. Huh, you know, there's, I mean, the, the discussion or whatever, it stops right there and then, you know, these young Japanese people who are perfectly well-educated, very nice people, they are being left out. And I think this is what's happening right now. Four years before Japan attacked America, America defended China. No matter how many uh, difficult issues dividing China these days, we will never forget our savior. And uh, with our reform, U.S. injected so much U.S. dollar, transferred so many valuable technologies, and uh, bought so much Chinese prod products to lift China. We remain eternally grateful. War cannot save any single country rather than only devastation of economy and society would prevail. I strongly believe in uh, this is cr crucial for U.S., Japan, China, and with other Asian neighbors to secure a solid foundation of an intellectual dialogue and free economic and cultural exchange wherever it happens at the governmental level. There's going to be a debate in the United States about some of the things that we've taken for granted about the United States in this part of the world, American economic policy and strategy, uh, American force posture, how we're postured, American alliances, uh, and so on. Um, but what's missing from that debate, to my mind, is, and I don't need to tell all of you this, the complexity of Asia today. And so as someone who has spent a lot of time both in and out of government in Asia, not just East Asia, but South Asia, and Central Asia, for that matter, um, I think some of that complexity is lost, and the United States is going to be confronting a set of choices in this part of the world that debates about a rebalance framed as if this was Europe in the 19th century don't entirely capture. So what I want to do is I want to step back and just talk about three of those kind of strategic dynamics as a way of framing the US, China, Japan. The first is the collision between economics and security between economic integration on the one hand and security fragmentation on the other, and what that means for the United States as traditionally a public goods provider in Asia in both of those realms. Um, second is, as we heard a little bit last night from George, the reintegration of historical Asia, something that conforms more to the historical norm, not just the Cold War norm, uh, of Asia as an integrated, not just economic space, but strategic space. Uh, and last, the fact that pan-Asian ideas, ideologies, institutions, uh, things that don't always include the United States, I think, uh, are going to proceed uh, sometimes regardless of American views and preferences. Uh, and that's something that the United States has had a lot of trouble coming to terms with the relationship between pan-Asian and trans-Pacific ideas and institutions. I think that, uh, you know, Singapore and China have a great relationship. There's a lot of partnership and there's a feeling of mutuality in the region. And so I think the discussion, it's less sort of Western Chinese differences. It's the, the discussions are much more collaborative and constructive, maybe a little bit re richer and deeper. 
So I think it's very useful. 我觉得就是给我们在这个技术上又提升了一个高度。呃，您可能也知道，就是“一带一路”现在是一个大的战略方向。那么，我们也是在学习，在理解“一带一路”会给我们提供哪些方面的商机。但这次论坛呢，有一个非常好的点，就是它突出了在新加坡这样一个很好的国际化平台上，“一带一路”如何去实施。很多国家机构。学者啊，或者呃各种不同背景的学者，都在研究啊，新加坡如何在“一带一路”上面发挥更好的作用。新加坡的企业和社会能够从中得到哪些收益？但是我们从中资呃背景的公司来说，我更注重的是咳咳我们如何去和我们已经在这里已经有十六年历史的新加坡啊这样一个平台更好的嫁接。啊，不单纯以中资公司背景出去，而是中国和新加坡共同合作去走向“一带一路”实现发展。这个平台，今天这个论坛给我们提供了一个非常好的一个思路。I'd say the number one takeaway is the level of concern about uh, uh, how China is doing on the reform trajectory.、Um, there's a, I think there's a broad sense that、uh, reform is needed. Uh, that rebalancing is important, and it's clear that people in China also share that view. I mean, that's why the Third Plenum took the decisions that it took about reform. So, reform is not an intellectual problem; it's a political one. You know, can China break through the obstacles, the vested interests, the other things that are arrayed uh, uh, to obstruct reform and maybe prevent reform? There's clearly a lot of concern around the world about China's progress toward meeting those reform goals, and so my main takeaway thus far is to really hear that level of concern expressed by people from around Asia,、uh, but also to see the way in which、uh, even a lot of people from China are grappling with those questions. Future China Global Forum is organized by Business China Singapore, in partnership with our sponsors and partners.